Aa, Hocam sesim alabiliyor musunuz? Evet biz duyuyoruz şu an size. Tamam ben e, size... So, dear colleagues, I'm Professor Dr. Alp Burak Çatakoğlu from the hospital and Istinye University. It's a great honor for me to start this uh, first webinar of International uh, Medical uh, Academy of Science. And uh, it's a great pleasure uh, on behalf of the, uh, uh, of the committee uh, to present my uh, bifurcation uh, webinar. So it's a project that has started in the hospital uh, with um, 
with our CEO, uh, Miri Stroti, and a uh, very distinguished uh, colleague of mine, Professor Talantbek Bataliev. Uh, and it's a, it's a great honor to be a part of this. And I hope uh, it will be a fruitful session today and uh, the cardiology uh, department uh, is going to present you some different aspects of uh, cardiology and I'm going to start with interventional cardiology. The topic I have chosen was uh, bifurcation lesions and today uh, we were going to discuss uh, about bifurcation uh, PCI. As you know, it's a great debate uh, which technique to use, whether to uh, advance with a single stand or double stanting, um, and which technique is better than the other. Of course, there's lots of debates. And uh, as part of uh, European Bifurcation Club, uh, I'm also a member of it, and I'm representing Turkey. And uh, we every year discuss different aspects, whether to make a proximal optimization routinely, uh, before uh, finishing the case, whether we should do a final kissing balloon, how we should do, which balloon should we use. So there are lots of questions to ask and uh, the answers uh, always changes year by year. So I'm open to questions and in, co in case you want to interrupt me, if you want to take part uh, during this session and want to ask me some questions, if you want to discuss, if you have other ideas, uh, I'm open to discuss. So in my today's topic, uh, I first will start with the basics. I mean the anatomy, the physiology, uh, and some uh, basic concepts. And after that, uh, I will show you some cases. So during the cases, uh, I'm also going to ask you questions. You can ask me questions and uh, I hope it will be an interactive session. So uh, the bifurcation PCI, uh, I know that the topic is the best practice, but this best practice changes every year. But I'm going to tell you the current uh, state. As you know, uh, when we talk about bifurcations, bifurcation has a fractal design. I mean, the proximal diameter is uh, always bigger than the distal diameters. And uh, as the coronary arteries branches, uh, of course, uh, the diameter uh, decreases. And we have uh, lots of formulas about that, uh, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional. Uh, but uh, you know that the Fine formula uh, is the best known uh, formula that shows that um, the, the D1, I mean the proximal diameter, uh, is the, uh, uh, is the um, is three times the distal diameters of the uh, vessels. Of course, technology has uh, helped us to understand this fractal design more. And uh, with the CT scan, we have uh, lots of data from all, both healthy uh, subjects and also uh, people, um, patients who have uh, coronary artery disease. So with the CT scan, we have a model uh, that has uh, coming data from the central line and also from the surface data. And as you see in this uh, picture, we can observe both the uh, left system and the right system and uh, have many uh, information from this uh, three-dimensional modeling uh, that comes from the CT scan. So what we have learned so far is the left main anatomy uh, has some numbers. And uh, as you see in this diagram, the, the normal left main has an eight millimeter square of area in the, uh, in the proximal side, the LAD has a six millimeter square and the circumflex artery has a five millimeter square of area in the proximal. So uh, this helps, of course, us to optimize the, uh, the procedure because uh, when you finish the case, uh, these are the numbers that you want to achieve. Uh, if you have the ability to have an intercoronary uh, imaging like IBUS or OCT which of course we recommend a lot also as um, the European Bifurcation Club to have an intercoronary uh, imaging uh, capability in your laboratory. This could be either an IBUS or an OCT. So from this uh, CT scan, we have uh, also data, not only from the left main, uh, but also from the left uh, anterior descending, the left circumflex and also uh, the RCA. And most of these measurements come from uh, either IBUS, uh, QCA, uh, or CT scan. 
So the, the next uh, slides, I'm going to show the results of the CT scans, which uh, show healthy subjects. And as you see in this diagram, uh, most of, the, uh, uh, of the, the healthy subjects have a mean diameter of left main uh, 3.7 millimeters. And the LAD uh, diameter in the proximal part is 3.3. The left circumflex is 3.2. We not only have the, uh, the diameters, but also the angles. And we have the A, B, and C angles in the bifurcation, which usually we uh, prefer the B angle, which is the angle between the side branches and the main branch. And uh, the left main bifurcation, B angle, is approximately 67 degrees. And uh, these numbers come from healthy subjects, as I've told. We also have data uh, from the left main uh, as a length, and we know that the length is approximately uh, 10 millimeters in the left main in healthy subjects, uh, which is also confirmed by a CT scan. So the normal proximal diameters, as I've shown you before, uh, we have uh, many um, numbers here in this diagram, and this one shows the LED proximal, which is 3.3, as as I have shown you before. And the circumflex proximal artery has a diameter of 3.2. And the RCA in healthy subjects, it's around 3.4 millimeters. These numbers are important because uh, also uh, when you want to achieve a, a good results in bifurcation lesions, you have to be aware of the healthy uh, diameters because when the patient comes with a diffuse coronary artery disease, of course, um, you, have, you, have, you may have a mistake to, uh, to underestimate uh, the diameters. Uh, and in case you uh, prefer a smaller stent, a smaller size stent, uh, of course, the underexpansion of the stent will uh, cause you uh, further problems like restenosis or stent thrombosis. So uh, I will. Uh, progress one by one and I will start, I've started with the left main and now uh, we will discuss on the LAD and diagonal anatomy. And as you see in this uh, LAD diagonal one anatomy, uh, the size of the diagonal branch is around 2.5 in healthy subjects, which is in the main vessel is 3.5 in the LAD. And the angle, uh, the B angle is usually 49.2 in healthy subjects. And these numbers come from around uh, 300 um, cases uh, collected data from a CT scan atlas. And uh, this data shows the normal coronary anatomy. And when we come to the circumflex ops marginal, we see that the circumflex main vessel is around 3.4 millimeter in diameter in healthy subjects. And the ops marginal one branch is around 2.7 millimeters. And the angle is around 55, 51. So when we come to RCA distal, we see that the main branch is approximately 3.6. The posterior descending side branch is around 2.6 and the posterior lateral branch is around 2.5 millimeters in healthy subjects. And the B angle is around 57. So when we summarize, the B angle usually is around 60, 50 to 60 degrees in all LAD diagonal, circumflex optus marginal, and the RCA distal portion. So these numbers help us uh, in choosing our PCI technique because the size, the angle, uh, helps us to uh, understand whether we will lose this side branch or not. So we should maybe start with a two stand strategy just before the case. And also these numbers uh, will help us to understand the clinical outcomes. So it is a prognosis parameter. And in case, of course, you finish the case with, a, with an under, uh, undersized stent, that means you will have both acute problems during the case and also some chronic uh, complications during the long-term follow-up. And also this uh, sizing and the normal vessel anatomy is very important for us because in the future, we will have maybe some more uh, personalized uh, treatments and the CT scans and the modeling will help us to have an atlas of uh, normal uh, populations. 
maybe we should uh, uh, make these studies in different countries also. This is a US-based study, but we should, of course, replicate this study in uh, Europe and also in Asia. Uh, and uh, we should understand the normal anatomy of the normal population. And this will help us to understand this coronary artery anatomy better. And maybe we will have some 3D printed uh, materials in the, in the future, which will uh, exactly fit uh, the specific uh, coronary disease in this uh, specific patient. As you know, we have lots of classifications for bifurcations, which just started with the Lefebvre uh, classification. But today we are using Medina because it's simple and uh, it's simple to report and simple to, um, to remember. But we also have a very current, a very new um, classification for left main uh, bifurcation, which is the ABC uh, classification. So these were the previous classifications, which were very difficult to remember, as you see in the Lefebvre, the Duke classification, the Sanborn classifications, which has lots of details, the Safian classifications. And uh, maybe this one was the, the hardest one to remember, which is the move ahead classification. And it has lots of details like calcification, side branch size, uh, lesion length, etc. Uh, but as you see in this diagram, the Medina is the easiest one to remember, and it's also the easiest one to, to, um, to report. And uh, as you know, we, uh, we give either uh, the number zero or one, according to the uh, diseased um, segment of the vessel. If you have a disease in the proximal main branch, you give the number of one. If it is free of disease, you give the number zero. So in case you have uh, the disease in the distal branch, uh, the second part of this Medina classification is the distal main branch. And the third part is the side branch. So if you have a disease in both the proximal, uh, distal, and also in the side branch, that means you have a 111 Medina. If you have only a side branch disease only, uh, then you will have a 001 Medina. And uh, as you see, that's the easiest uh, classification that you can never see. We also have another classification uh, regarding the, the techniques of stenting, and uh, that is the MATS classification. And uh, this represents whether, uh, in case you start with the proximal part of the uh, bifurcation uh, by stenting or intervening the proximal side, that means you are in the M portion. And uh, of course, in this classification, you see that you can either put a stand across the side branch, you can start, um, you can just start with a distal, or you can start with a side branch like DK crush. And these are all uh, different uh, techniques classified in this MATS classification. So there is, um, for every class, you have a, at least one technique. So uh, I also want to summarize the very current uh, classification of the left main uh, bifurcation treatment. And it's very easy also to remember because there are um, three or four letters, the A, B, C, D. And in case uh, you have a small vessel, uh, the letter will become a lowercase letter. So uh, I will just show you some examples to make it uh, more easier. In, in case you have this uh, disease in the proximal left main and also in the distal uh, part of the main vessel, and also you have a disease in the side branch, this is an ABC. I mean, three of these uh, branches have the disease. But as you see, the circumflex artery is uh, relatively small than the, uh, than the other uh, branches. So that makes the C letter a lowercase letter. If this circumflex was as big as this LAD, this C would have been a, an uppercase C. In this example, we have a disease in the left uh, anteriorly a 010 lesion in Medina, but now we classify it as B because in the, in the first diagram, the A is the proximal uh, main branch, which is the distal left main. B is the, the osteal LAD, and C is representing the circumflex. So in this example, this is only a uppercase B. So let's discuss the, uh, the techniques. 
And uh, of course, my opinion is we should master in provisional stenting, which is the default strategy in bifurcation stenting. Of course, we should know the two stent strategies. And in my case, you should master at least two um, different uh, methods, two different techniques and two stent strategies. You should be aware of all the details. Uh, but of course, uh, I have to know, uh, I have to insist on uh, this default strategy uh, that it should be the provisional strategy. And uh, in this slide, I have uh, summarized my, my one year experience. And as you see, if you have 300 cases a year, uh, PCI cases a year, uh, approximately 15% of your cases will be bifurcations. And in only of these 15% of bifurcations, the 10% will have um, uh, an important side branch, which is, uh, which is more than 2.5 millimeters of diameter and which is longer than five millimeters. So that represents approximately four cases a year that you should do with two stent strategies. So most of your cases, I mean, the 295 cases will be done with a single stent, but only four cases will be done with two stents. Uh, but that doesn't mean that two stand strategies are not important. They are important, but uh, you should know every detail of this provisional stenting and bifurcation treatment, because if you um, if you finish the case perfect, of course the long term follow up will be perfect. So this is a representation of the step by step approach of provisional stenting, and it starts with two. Um, guide bars. I mean, you will always start a bifurcation case with two guide bars and never miss the side branch by just um, uh, trying to finish the case um, faster because uh, in case you lose the side branch, it will cause you more, uh, you will lose too much time just to rescue that uh, side branch. So it's a good option to start with two uh, guide bars just to protect the side branch. Because in case you lose a side branch, you all, you have the guide bar there and you can still use that guide bar or you can use that guide bar as a guide to rewire with the third guide bar. So you should start with two guide bars. After you put the stent to the main vessel, uh, you should still, um, the side branch uh, guide bar should stay there uh, until you finish this pot and rewire the side branch. So the, the third part is the pot, the proximal optimization, which is a very important step in provisional stenting. And you should never, uh, you should never advance the case without doing this initial pot, uh, because I will show you later uh, what this um, can cause. So after this pot, you will rewire the side branch with a third guide wire. And after that third guide wire, you can just uh, retrieve your, your initial side branch wire and it will not cause any problem to have your uh, guide wire uh, under, the, uh, under the main vessel stent because it will be very easy for you to, to retrieve the first guide wire. So after this rewiring, uh, you will do a, a balloon uh, angioplasty in the side branch. You can do a balloon angioplasty in the side branch if you have a problem in the osteal part of the side branch, but uh, in case it's clean, I mean, if the side branch is open, uh, if you have timid tree flow, or if you have the ability to, uh, to measure the FFR and it's normal, you can just leave the case after this pot. But if you have to continue to the side branch, if there is uh, some carina shift in the side branch, of course, you can rewire the side branch. And after that rewiring, you can retrieve the initial guide wire. You can balloon the side branch to a kiss, but in case you make an intervention to the side branch, you always have to return to that, to that pot um, step because there will be a, a deformation just in front of the side branch, which will cause uh, stent thrombosis or re in the follow-up. So I will show you these are very special images that is coming from the uh, Visible Heart uh, Laboratory from Minnesota. So there is, uh, you can see just inside the vessel and I will go step by step. So it will be a slow uh, advancement of slice. So here you see that both branches are 
uh, wired and after that uh, wiring you you insert a main uh, branch stent and implant it on the main vessel in this case there is a 3.5 to 26 uh, onyx resolute stent and the stent is inflated as you see the side branch stent uh, is just under the uh, stent And as you see, there is still some gap in the proximal part because you always choose the stent according to the distal reference diameter. So usually if you if the distal reference diameter is a 3.5, the proximal will be around 3.8. So you need to optimize this proximal part. Otherwise, you will have difficulty in, uh, in just opposing this proximal part. And uh, that will translate to a stent thrombosis or restenosis in the future. And sometimes you have it in the acute, just in the, the following hours. So in this uh, case, the operator just tries to advance a third guide wire. And as you see, the guide wire can go just underneath the, the, the proximal stent, which will cause a terrific, a terrible, uh, terrible um, uh, stent malformation just in case you just advance the guide wire from uh, from a uh, from a wrong strut of course it will result uh, as a disaster so this is just uh, the proof that you will have problems in case you do not make the pause and on the left side you will see the angiographic view in which uh, the operator has difficulty in advancing the the guide wire but he succeeds. Uh, but unfortunately, the guide wire goes just under the proximal strut of the stent. And in case you advance a balloon or a stent from this wrong strut, as I've said, it will result, result in a disaster. And your, your uh, procedure uh, will become longer and longer just to solve this complication. But after you put the main vessel stent, in, in case you make the proximal optimization, it is very easy for you to, uh, to advance the guide wire to the side branch and continue the, uh, uh, continue the procedure. Here you see a balloon, which is a 4.0 to 12 millimeters uh, of a semi-compliant balloon in the proximal part, uh, which makes the uh, position of the proximal main vessel perfect. So it's, it is a post perfectly and you don't have the chance to have your third guide bar to go under this proximal stent. So now the rewiring is made simple, just by a simple proximal optimization. And as you see in this visible heart model, the third guide bar will advance to the side branch quite easily. Another tip and trick is to advance this third guide wire from the distal strut, which will help you to to make uh, the case perfect uh, because this um, distal strut will make the proximal stand open just uh, across the side branch and um, of course it will result in a better uh, a position of both the proximal and the distal part. So after you do this rewiring, you can do a kissing balloon. Of course, this is just uh, according to the operator. It's not a requirement. Because if the side branch, if you didn't lose the side branch and you don't have to do any, any, any further standing to the side branch, um, the proximal optimization is enough to finish the case. But if you have to advance to the side branch, to make a kissing balloon is uh, simple by just um, inflating two, the balloon in the main vessel and the side branch. Of course, the sizes that you will choose is very important. And in case you make a side branch ballooning, it is recommended by the EBC to, to finish the case with a final pot. Some call this a repot, some call this a final pot, uh, but the EBC now calls this as uh, a final pot. So after you do all these steps, I mean the main vessel stands, pot, and in case you need a side branch balloon or a kissing balloon, finish the case with a final pot a perfect a position is accomplished, as you see in the visible heart model also. 
So provisional is default because you can always put a second stent when you need it. Uh, you can advance with a tap stenting. You can make a reverse crush. You can do a clot. So you have plenty of options in case you just start the case with a provisional stenting. You always have the option to advance to a two stent strategy. But the reverse is difficult. I mean, if you just started the case with a two stent strategy, it is very difficult to finish the case with a single stent. So provisional should be default. This diagram shows the tap stenting in which you put the main vessel stent and optimize it. You put a second stent to the side branch uh, just with a minimal, uh, minimal protrusion to the main vessel. And you make, a, you make a kissing balloon after you implant the side branch stent, which should be a minimal kiss, a mini kiss. You shouldn't advance both of the balloons just to the start, to the proximal part of the main vessel because we want to finish the case uh, with a circular anatomy. We don't want to finish with an elliptic deformation. So in case you make the, the kissing balloon a uh, standard way, not the mini way, you should uh, finish the case with a final pose. But of course, uh, the, the very important uh, trick here is to choose a, a smaller uh, pot balloon and the pot balloon marker should never advance to the carina because there is a minimal protrusion here. And in case you advance this balloon more distally, you will finish with a crush of the side branch stent, which we don't want to see. And in case you, uh, by, uh, by mistake, you make a distal uh, proximal, uh, a distal inflation of your balloon, uh, you should change the strategy. Maybe it should turn to a, a reverse DK crush or something else. Um, but to avoid this, you have to inflate the balloon in the proximal parts. So now I want to uh, just advance these slides um, to come to real examples, to real uh, examples. And uh, this is one of my patients, which is a 61-year-old male patient who had um, stable coronary disease. He also had hypercholesterolemia and a syntax score of 44, which means, of course, bypass surgery. But the patient refused uh, bypass surgery, and uh, he wanted to uh, have our opinion whether we should continue. We could continue with a stenting procedure, and uh, we had the opportunity to have uh, the, the uh, to advance with PCI. This patient had the lesion in the distal left main. In the circumflex ops marginal portion and also in the LAD. He also had a disease in the RCA, which is a CTO, but the right coronary artery seems to be a small vessel. So we concentrated on the left system and we started with the ops marginal and we pre dilated the ops marginal with a 2.5 millimeter balloon, as you see. And after this pre dilation, um, you will see the result, the, the control image. After that, we have chosen a long uh, drug eluting stent, uh, which is a 2.75 to 38 millimeter uh, drug eluting stent, which was implanted to the optus marginal at 20 atmospheres. And I want to take your attention to the two guide wires. There is always a second guide wire on the main vessel. Uh, because in order you have a problem in the main vessel, uh, this guide wire will guide you and help you to, to solve the main vessel problem. After we have implanted the side branch stent, we post dilated uh, with a 3 millimeter NC balloon at 24 atmospheres. And you will see the result of the optus marginal, which was, which was quite good with a symmetry flow. And the main vessel was clean. There was no Carina shift or any other problems. And uh, we, we didn't take any other steps for this circumflex artery. And we continued with the LAD and uh, left main. Here you see the pre dilation with a three millimeter balloon of the LAD. And uh, I also want to take your attention that we have a guide wire on the diagonal branch. And after that, we, uh, we implanted a stent 
So the LAD proximal segment with a 3.5 to 28 millimeter of drug eluting stent. And this was the result. This stand was placed on the LED proximal and we still had the problem in the left main distal. So we have um, chosen it four to 23 millimeter of drug eluting stand for the left main. And it was implanted. And after the implantation, we made a proximal optimization with an NC balloon, which was 4.5 in diameter. And because it was a uh, it was a left main disease uh, at that time, uh, my recommendation was to make a final kissing balloon in every left main patient. Either he didn't have any problem in the side branch also, because uh, some studies, some bench studies, have shown uh, previously that uh, it was it has a, it had an advantage in the side branch regarding the uh, the blood flow and the uh, and the fluid dynamics. So in every patient uh, until um, to 2020, I, I was just uh, making a final kissing balloon to the main branch. But now I'm not uh, making a final kissing balloon uh, routinely in five and left main bifurcations. So after this uh, kissing balloon, which was a mini kiss, uh, the result was okay for me. So this example has shown us that also in very complex patients that needs surgery, you can finish the case with provisional stenting. So you don't need to put two stents in every bifurcation. And as I've uh, mentioned before, only four, pa four patients in, uh, among 300 patients needs a two stent strategy. So in this case, you see in different angles that the left main, the ops marginal, and the LAD was treated with stenting. We have plenty of two stent techniques. The mostly uh, known ones are the kilots, the DK crush, the tap stenting. But we also know uh, some. Uh, we have some less known um, uh, techniques: the inverted provisional, the highway technique, which was invented by me in 2009, uh, the balloon trap, the slipstream, nano crush, flower petal stenting or simultaneous kissing stenting. It, it's a long list. But uh, in my opinion, these three uh, techniques and the provisional technique will be enough for you to treat maybe most of your patients. So uh, there is a stenting technique, which is not mentioned here in the slide, uh, which was just invented this year. And it's called a DK culotte technique. So I'm going to show you first on a, on a real uh, on a real example. This is a 53 year old male patient, which is a stable coronary artery disease patient. He has diabetes and the uh, hypertension, and he had a previous drug eluting stent. So you will see this coronary angiogram of this patient. This is the RCA. It seems to be uh, open. And you also see the left system, the left main, the, the circumflex artery. There is an intermediate artery, which is also quite large for the stent inside, and also an LAD. So our uh, plan was to wire uh, three of the branches to treat the left main disease. Uh, we wired um, the uh, circumflex, the LAD, and also the intermediate artery. We use a seven French radial access and a seven French extra backup uh, guiding catheter to treat this vessel. So how is a DK kilot performed? A DK kilot is uh, nearly the same as a kilot stenting, but it has an extra, kilo, uh, an extra uh, kissing balloon step, which I will show. So we will start with a, with a side branch stenting first and after the side brain stenting, you make a pot to the proximal main vessel. And after that, you rewire the side branch and uh, position your balloons to the side branch and the main vessel. And then you inflate it. I mean, you make the first kissing balloon. After that, you, uh, to, you insert your main vessel stand and, and uh, 
you, uh, you implant it to the main vessel. Then you make a pot again to optimize the proximal part. And after that, you rewire the side branch and the main vessel and make a second kissing balloon. And you finish the case with a pot again. So this is the DK clause. What is the advantage? The advantage is shown in a bench test of 24 models. And it was um, compared with DK crush and with the standard kilos. And it was seen that it was a more uh, faster uh, procedure, the DK kilot, uh, compared to DK crush or a standard kilot. And the fluid dynamics were better than a standard kilot. And the standard position was better. In this diagram, you can see the detailed information about the results of, regarding the, the position and also the fluid dynamics of this DK clot technique. So how we achieved the DK clot uh, technique in this patient, we, uh, we inserted our uh, initial stand to the circumflex and dilated with a three millimeter uh, balloon at 16 atmospheres. And then we have implanted a 3.5 to 18 millimeter of resolute onyx drug eluting stent to the circumflex. So this was the first step. After that, we have done a 4.5 millimeter NC balloon proximal optimization. And then we have done our first kissing balloon. After the first kiss, this is the result. Now we have inserted, implanted a 3.5 to 20, 22 millimeter of resolute on extent to the LAD, from left main to the LAD. And we have done a proximal optimization with a 4.5 NC balloon. And after the proximal optimization, you will see the results. So both the LAD and the circumflex arteries were treated. So after this implantation, the patient had some chest pain and it just began to progress just a couple of seconds later. And we have seen that we have lost, we are going to lose the, uh, the intermediate branch, which was the cause of this chest pain. And uh, here we have seen that we have lost the intermediate branch uh, uh, just a couple of seconds later. But for sake, we had the guide wire there and we tried to advance another guide wire to the intermediate branch. And we have we succeeded in, in rewiring this intermediate branch and we pre-dilated it with a 1.5 millimeter of balloon, just right at the ostium of the intermediate artery. And then we advanced the 2.5 millimeter of balloon to the intermediate artery and dilated it there. After that, we, uh, we made a kissing balloon with a 2.5 millimeter at the intermediate artery and 3.5 millimeter in the circumflex artery. And then we have implanted a 3 to 18 millimeter resolute onyx drug eluting stent to the uh, intermediate artery. And in this uh, video, you see, in this image, you see that we have uh, parked a balloon to the LAD branch. Then we have made a kissing balloon with a 3.5 millimeter of balloon in the LAD and a 3 millimeter of balloon in the intermediate artery. And the final step was a triple kissing, which was done with a 3.5 millimeter of balloon in the LAD, a 3 millimeter balloon both in the intermediate and the circumflex arteries. And finally, we finished the case with a 4.5 millimeter of NC balloon by making a proximal optimization of 30 atmospheres. So this is the result. And as you see, both, uh, all of the branches are uh, in good shape, the left main, the LAD, the circumflex and the intermediate artery. So maybe we can stop just here. Um, and I want to ask if you want to, uh, to participate, if you have some questions regarding this case or regarding the, uh, 
the, the data that I've shared with you. So maybe we can discuss. I can wait for uh, for one or two minutes. If you have questions, I, I will be pleased to answer them. If not, I'm going to um, continue for the next 15 minutes. I'll just uh, show you some tips and tricks and maybe one or two more cases. And I'm going to finish the session. So if you have any questions, um, I will, uh, we will be pleased to answer them. Здравствуйте. We also have the uh, raise hand opportunity. If you want to show yourself and ask your question face by face, you can take part. Uh, so it's up to you. So I'm going to continue. And in case you have the questions, I'm going to stop uh, and answer your questions. So this part is a very important tip and trick. Uh, as you know, if you put the stent to the main vessel, and in case you have a balloon dilatation in the side branch, you will always finish with a side branch uh, with a main vessel stent deformation, which is very, very important because in case you don't deal with this problem, um, it will end up with uh, stent thrombosis or restenosis. And stent thrombosis is sometimes very really dramatic, which happens just in a couple of minutes or in a couple of hours. This is another uh, trick. You always have to choose the distal side branch to have a better result. Uh, to rewire the, the guide bar, you need to choose the distal strut. Because in this image, you will see that in case you prefer the proximal strut, there will still be some deformation and the proximal covering of the side branch will be incomplete. But in case you uh, prefer the distal strut, which is not an easy step, and it requires some, of course, experience. And in case you, of course, have OCT or IBUS, you will see it online live, whether you're on the right uh, strut or not. But if you choose the distal strut, of course, you will have some proximal covering of the side branch. And this will uh, make the, the, the procedure perfect. The elliptic deformation is another deformation that we see in bifurcation treatment. And this happens when you uh, when you choose to uh, to make the kissing balloon in a standard and classic way, which was done previously, and uh, the classic way is to to uh, to retrieve the balloons to cover all the proximal uh, part of the stent in the main vessel, and in that case, of course, you finish with an elliptic deformation. But if you do this with a mini kiss, if you just retrieve the balloons minimally to the main vessel, you will have the elliptic deformation only. Um, only in a, in, a, in, a, in a smaller part. And uh, you can, of course, finish the case always with a final pot, which will correct this elliptic deformation and return to the circular uh, anatomy. So this is a 3D OCT um, representation of this elliptic deformation. Uh, in the upper part, you see the minimal overlap with the pot which results with a circular anatomy. But if you do the kissing balloon with a classic way, of course, you will have some elliptic deformation in the proximal segment of your main vessel stent. There are lots of studies just to compare whether this is very important clinically uh, or not. Of course, we don't have very uh, strong data that this elliptic deformation causes um, late uh, restenosis or stent thrombosis. Uh, there is no uh, strong data about that. Uh, but we have lots of bench tests which show that the shear stress and the fluid dynamics is better when you finish the case with a circular anatomy. Of course, to achieve this perfect result, the best practice, uh, it's also important to, uh, to understand which balloon size you should use. And in our CAT lab, we use this diagram because it's difficult to, to, to summarize. But uh, this uh, diagram shows you which size of balloon you should uh, choose in the side branch and in the main vessel when you make a, a kissing balloon. So now we have uh, lots of examples and there's a long list, uh, but we have only 10 minutes to go and uh, I'm just going to choose uh, maybe one or two of them. 
So there is a question, of course, uh, Dr. Omurbek Uraimov uh, wants to ask a question. Sure, you can uh, either take parts or you can write your question. Dr. Omerbek, we must express it. Until the question comes, I'm going to uh, advance with the, the cases. So in this diagram, we have lots of cases. Uh, now I'm going to maybe choose a DK crush, which is a more complicated case. And after that, we can return to a provisional case, maybe again. So this is a DK crush example. In this example, we have a 56-year-old male patient, which has uh, which had a non-ST elevation MI, and uh, as risk factors, he had hypertension and hypercholesterolemia. And here we see a, a critical LED diagonal lesion, uh, which is nearly sub subtotal, and it's a 111 Medina lesion. Just want to uh, <clears throat> make the videos work. So I need a couple of minutes. Okay, so there is a problem with the video. Um, so maybe it's better to discuss uh, after that. We have, of course, lots of tips and tricks. Maybe the next time uh, I'm going to show you more examples uh, regarding the, uh, the practical approach, uh, my own approach and the, uh, the EBC recommendations. And uh, it's very difficult, of course, for me just to summarize a very hot topic um, in just uh, one hour, but I hope we will meet again during this uh, Contemporary Medical Academy of Science meetings. And uh, I hope we, we will have some time to meet also face to face and to have these educations together because I, I believe that we have lots of things to learn from each other. And this was of course my part to, to uh, just summarize uh, my own opinion and some opinions from the EBC. Uh, but I would also like to learn your approach and your tips and tricks because we have lots of things to learn from each other. Uh, so I have seen the question from uh, Dr. Emirbek, and he says, thank you for your perfect presentation. Thank you very much to, uh, to be a part of this. Uh, our team from Kyrgyzstan wants to thank you. And the question is, uh, which technique has better long-term results? So that's a very good question and we're discussing a lot on, on this topic in the EBC meetings and uh, of course the Asian uh, colleagues uh, from Korea uh, have done lots of researches on DK crush and uh, they're performing this DK crush technique uh, perfectly and uh, of course the results are uh, quite good compared to, uh, to pilot technique, to tap technique or other techniques. There's also some, uh, some debate whether DK crush is better than uh, provisional stenting because some recent papers have shown that DK crush is better than any technique. Uh, but of course, there are some bias on this because the, the group that is um, making these uh, researches and writing these papers are all from Korea. And uh, they are, uh, I mean, they are 
mostly oriented to this DK crush technique. And uh, when you read the papers of DK crush five or some other DK crush papers, you see that um, the, the, the procedure is standardized, as I've told you in this presentation. I mean, the DK crush has some steps and the, and the committee is just uh, looking after whether the operator is doing the DK crush as in the protocol or not. But the other techniques like culotte, tap or provisional stenting uh, was not uh, described in detail. And uh, the committee is not uh, just uh, looking after whether the operator is performing the case uh, perfectly as, as in protocol or not. So when you uh, compare two strategies, uh, the DK crush, which is um, done perfectly by Korean colleagues, and the other techniques like provisional or culotte, which is usually preferred by European or US colleagues, then of course DK crush uh, just results with better outcomes. Um, but of course, this is a point in which we have to discuss in detail. And it's uh, really difficult to answer today because we have no answer for this uh, question exactly. But according to papers and uh, to, uh, to the data that comes from Korea, DK crush is better than other techniques. And in case you need to choose a two-stand strategy, DK crush seems to be a good alternative. So that's, that's the answer of mine. So any other questions? <clears throat> okay. So today we have other sessions uh, that will cover uh, imaging and also that will cover some uh, aortic disease, um, aortic stenosis treatment with TAVI. And uh, I hope you will enjoy the other sessions also. Uh, of course, you can contact me whenever you want and uh, we can talk on email or on phone or by Zoom whenever you want. And it will be a pleasure for me to collaborate, to interact with you and to, uh, to learn much from you. So thank you for, uh, very much for attending this webinar. I would uh, like to thank on behalf of the founders of International uh, Academy of Medical, Medical uh, Contemporary Medical Academy of Science. Uh, and I hope to see you soon face by face. Goodbye.
My dear colleagues, I am Tuba Kemalogos from Turkey, and it's a big pleasure for me to make this presentation in such a great organization. Today, my uh, topic is never without treaty. It's my professional pa uh, passion, and I feel so much lucky to uh, tell you my experience about it. My presentation will take about 15 minutes, and I will summarize what is the incremental value of treaty over to the equine valvular disease, left ventricle assessment, right ventricle assessment, and finally, uh, congenital heart diseases. At the end of my presentation, I will tell you a short story as a take home message. I am the coordinator of International Young Academy, and despite our association is very uh, young, only 21% of cardiologists use 3D echo in their clinical practices. Only one in five cardiologists use 3D echo, which is very, very low rate for this century. Please take a look at these two images. The image on the left side uh, taken in 12, sorry, uh, 2011 and other in 2021. Please на левой стороне и на правой стороне два uh, рисунка. В последние 10 лет мы видим прогресс за Мы видим патологию болезни. Благодаря 3D мы можем видеть и разглядеть болезнь. А без 3D это так детально не будет видно. На правой было видно болезнь, а на левой продвижение и детально. Мы видим uh, на двин, uh, катетер 12-часовой позиции. Another good news is about a tricuspid valve. Before 3D echocardiography, I was thinking that tricuspid valve has three leaflets, but unfortunately not. I know that every patient has totally different tricuspid valve, and mostly doesn't they doesn't have uh, three leaflets. The tricuspid valve on the right side on the right side consists of five leaflets. However, other has three leaflets, and as you see, posterior leaflet is very, very small and uh, teeny. We don't mind tricuspid valve as much as uh, mitral valve. It's also so much important and good news is transthoracic echo is really very enough for evaluation of tricuspid valve. If we understand the valve completely better than a surgeon, we find the right treatment option. Also, uh, there are many peritoneal treatment strategies for tricuspid valve, as aneuploplasty devices, coaptation devices, heterotopic valves, peritoneal valves. 
Uh, yes, uh, as you know, we can get a face view of Arctic by uh, while by 2D echo. And as you know, 2D resolution. We можем измерить Arctic Volvo. The contribution of 3D echo to Arctic wild disease assessment is limited. However, 2D underestimate our diameters and correlation between 3D and CT is still very good. Especially, 3D plays an important role in measurements of Arctic wild. Aorta and aortic annulus. Additionally, 3D echo is very important uh, pay for patient selection and wife selection before TAVI procedures. 2D echo underestimate uh, left ventricle out, outflow tract area and aortic valve area by about uh, 60%. We should cho choose the most suitable valve and most suitable patient. Actually, I would like to shortly touch the pulmonary valve. It's my favorite one, and especially 3D echocardiography plays an important role in evolution of pulmonary, pulmonary valve disorders. Pulmonary stenosis severity is class, classified according to transpulmonary pressure gradient and maximal velocity. Actually, I think it's not enough. The pulmonary valve area can, can't be calculated by planimetry using 2D echocardiography and conventional techniques because the emphase view of uh, pulmonary valve is generally unavailable. If there is stenosis, pulmonary uh, valve can be visualized better because the valve are usually thicker than normal leaflets. It's possible to see emphase view of pulmonary valve and detect of leaflet types. Additionally, it's possible to measure the valve area, robot area, and using 3D echocardiography. As you see in this case, I calculated pulmonary valve area and uh, subvalvular stenosis. The, the peak gradient and peak velocity of pulmonary valve can be affected by many situations as other valves, like pregnancies, left to right chance, pulmonary regurgitation and they may lead to misclassification of pulmonary stenosis severity and also may influence the accuracy of the time and necessary treatment strategies. Additionally, 3DT can change uh, half of pulmonary stenosis patient treatment strategy in our study. Также 3D может изменить половину болезней. Transpulmonary echocardiography is useful when there is a good acoustic 2D window. As in this case, we can see three leaflets of pulmonary Мы здесь можем uh, видеть разницу 3D и 2D. Uh, анализы 3D и 2D. Мы можем делать uh, одновременно детальные анализы. So, uh, intra-observer and intra-observer variability is uh, better than 2D echocardiography. Мы видим, что 3D анализы намного лучше, чем 2D echo. And it's very useful during stress echocardiography. Uh, however, we are capable to evaluate each le left ventricular segment separately to analyze. This is not enough, and we are going more. We want more. The new technology is developing with this. Also, new technologies. We see how they are advancing. On the left, we see 3D, and his print on his hands, how he looks in the Также у нас есть намного больше информации благодаря 3D. Четыре года назад Америка и Европа сделали исследование, которое очень полезно и рекомендует 3D для болезни сердца. На левой стороне мы видим болезнь 
И на правой другой, другую болезнь. Не только такие виды болезни можно видеть с 3D, но также и аортические болезни. Мы можем измерить благодаря 3D аорту. Я хочу закончить свою презентацию. Nokia была одной из самых лучших компаний. Мы не сделали ничего плохого, но мы, мы заканчиваем плохо не потому, что мы не сделали ничего плохого, а потому, что мы не продвигались и не делали ничего лучшего, чтобы продвигать свою компанию. И делали в... Если вы ничего нового и лучшего не сделаете, вы будете исключены. Большое спасибо, было очень приятно с вами работать. Спасибо.
Hello, colleagues. Um, I'm Dr. Ebru Özenç from the Hospital. I'm colleague. Я специалист в клинике мы всегда выбираем коронарианжу And so uh, two techniques are uh, applied in coronary CT angiographies. One is prospective ECG triggering, which is evaluated during mid diastole or end systole. And uh, we can take the portion of the mid diastolic or end systolic phase, which in which the motion artifacts are minimized. So prospective ECG triggering is the period, is the diagnostic modality that Диагностик мы видим уменьшение коронарной артерии. Все это делается для того, чтобы уменьшить коронарную артерию. CT нам нужен для коронарной артерии э, 64% на 66%. Здесь есть дозы радиации во время ради... коронарной артерии. Во время X-ray это 0,1%. У женщин из-за груди это с 10 до 13 процентов радиации, и у мужчин чуть меньше, от 6 до 10. За последнее время процентов радиация уменьшилась по везде. Во время Анжу мы увидели, что радиации, дозы радиации намного увольшились. Дозы радиации уменьшаются, когда масса тела намного больше, когда масса сердца больше. Но Сити уменьшает радиацию во время анжу короны уменьшается радиация дозу и 
10 процентов больше массы тела убольшает радиацию на 10 процентов. Диагностика и прогностика, и пред, э, мы можем предугадать. Чем важна коронарная анжу, это тем, что После анатомических исследований мы можем понять разницу коронарную сети Анжу или Анжу на сердце корональный делают много вреда для тела, но дает ли это нам столько информации? Но самое, пол... но самое лучшее вещь в кардиологии когда сделаются все анализы, мы можем понять точно, делать ли дальше Здесь есть пару главных тем во время, э, про коронарную артерию. Первое — это меньше рисков на симптомы, меньше рисков на новые болезни. Также коронарная, коронарная дает нам полное исследование, обследование и лучшие э, анализы. Коронарная анжу – это номер один по диагностике. Но для лучшего нужно анжу. Также в, в скорой нужно выбирать э, и больше использовать э, коронари анжу. Благодаря анжу-анализам мы можем узнать 
точные анализы и про риски, если они. Также мы в скорых это называем тройные. Благодаря сети мы можем узнать про сердечные синдромы и корональную артерию. Другая важная тема в корональной артерии – это про Почему это прогностически важно? Это дает нам полную идею про, стоит ли классифицировать разные или нет. Fibrously rich or calcified plaques are more frequently seen in stable coronary artery disease, and so especially the soft plaques rich with the lipid. Мягкие тела. Когда мы видим тела, особенно мягкие тела в артерии, особенно в молодом теле, мы начинаем использовать статины и аспирин, Ту, чтобы прекратить синдром здесь фотографии показывают анжу коронарной э, артерии там видно э, гематомы которые появились после коронарной анжу Показывают гематомы в, 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 в... На левой стороне мы видим не, не классическую, а на правой классическую. Аномалии корональной артерии бывают такое, что в молодом теле, в спортсмене могут быть аномалии корональной артерии. И то есть, здесь только один процент риск смертельного риска. В основном у молодых спортсменов коронарная анжу бывает не открытая. процентов больше больше чувствительности и спецификации 
occlusion or the stenosis. But in the neck, major vessel stenosis or occlusion, because in the coronary artery bypass patients, the, the native arteries are frequently diffusely diseased, it's harder to um, evaluate the native arteries. But in the uh, graft uh, evaluation, uh, the coronary CT angiography has a great place to evaluate them. Coronary uh, angiography можно узнать э, намного больше. Канаральная артерия и стенды. Артефакты — это самая главная проблема. Меньше трех миллиметров диаметров. На левой э, из-за большего диаметра э, артефакт, главная проблема артефакта. In CT angiography, we performed uh, it, and later we get the results, anatomical results. And when we get anatomical results, anatomical results, they stenosis there inside the vessel. But we, if there is the arteriosclerosis there, is it clinically important or not? We should decide about that. To, to decide about the uh, arteriosclerosis uh, narrowing importance, uh, we should decide about first if there is symptom or not. Для нас самое главное, мы должны решить, что для нас что для нас э, в первую очередь должно быть важно во время диагностики. Что для нас важнее сделать э, функциальные или анатомические тесты? Потому что любой доктор в клинике хочет знать про для того, чтобы знать, что делать дальше, анжу или В основном мы выбираем тест, тесты синтеграфические. Want to say they need to perform a uh, stress test. Uh, if there is no functional abnormality, no further. Если там нет uh, нефункциональных, ненормальных, которые не нуждаются для дальнейших анатомических тестов, клиники uh, дальше от доктора к доктору меняется. По клинике и его но у нее в клинической практике практике она нуждается в том чтобы видеть 
в молодом э, человеке в болезни, она нуждается в том, чтобы знать про анатомические склеротические детально, есть ли там какие-то другие болезни или что было и почему. Потому что это очень важно для спасения жизни, особенно для молодых спортсменов. Новый концепт — это инока. В последнее время это очень популярный, это очень популярная тема инока. Инока меньше 50% стенозиса. Но от времени к времени это меняется. Иногда пациент приходит и говорит, у меня есть спинная болезнь, а иногда э, у пациента нет никаких жалоб. Это меняется от дню к дню. Пациенты инока в первое время, в первый год э, делают стресс-тесты и собираются симптомы и собираются функциональные ненормаль... ненормальности. Пациенты инока а, очень новые для клиник и докторов. Потому что у пациента могут быть может иметь артросклероз, ну а также иногда у него могут быть очень много разных э, болезней, а на следующий день он может прийти и не иметь ни одной э, жалобы. Титианжу мы предпочитаем больше всего в нашей практике, в наших больницах, так как его в в в анализах Ситианжу намного больше жизнеспасающих анализов, и э, это все про Ситианжу. Желаю вам удачи, спасибо.
put a Hello, my name is Hussein Aksu. It is Rasti, Minya Zaut Hussein Aksu. Yeah, her uh, cardiolog. For today, his advances in transcatheter art valve replacement. My theme is today: achievements in the field of transcatheter replacement of artery valves. Implantation. В Америке в основном используют название замена в, Евро в Европе измена. Здесь я вам буду объяснять uh, главную информацию введение стеноза аорта и роль ТАВИ, история ТАВИ, текущие данные и доказательства ТАВИ, планирование процедуры, достижения в ТАВИ и будущее для ТАВИ. Как нам известно, uh, артический стеноз Это сужение отверстия артального клапана. Главные причины артического стеноза во взрослых. Первое – это возраст от 60 лет из-за кальция. Вторая э, – ревматические болезни. Третья – врожденные аномалии. От э, возраст 50-59 лет э, делает больше риска артического стеноза э, 0,2%. 60-69 лет 1,3%, 70-79 лет прогресс и история артического стеноза, скорость, которая увеличится на 0,3 мм в секунду в год, градиация, которая увеличивается на 7 мм в год, а также увеличение замена артического стеноза увеличивает жизнь на 30-50 процентов артический стеноз в основном э, грозит жизни и После симптомов, симптомов 50% за два года увеличивается. Прогнозы арктического стигноза. Медицинские, медикальные терапии арктического стигноза. 
Не медикальные эффективные терапии, которые хирургические терапии. Транскатетерной терапии. Долгое время была только стандартная терапия артического стеноза, только вмешательства механические. Хирургические вмешательства Одна третья пациентов в реальной жизни не поддается хирургическому вмешательству, к сожалению. Также взрослые люди боятся хирургических вмешательств и отменяют все. Люди хотят локальные, быстрые и эффективные. Также в жизни. Также не хватает достаточного лечения для артического стеноза в жизни. Достижение Тави. В 2002 году Алайн Грибер помог пациенту с кардиотическим шоком. Тави пандемик за, за первую декаду 100 тысяч Тави было сделано. Все доказательства показывают помощь Тави пациентам. Испытания, клинические испытания Тави показывают высокий риск, высокий риск хирургического вмешательства. Испытания, которые не поддаются хирургическому вмешательству. Также э, клинические испытания показали, за, что сделано на больных с маленьким риском болезни. Метаанализы всего этого показывают, всех этих клинических испытаний показывают нам Тави, что Тави вмешательство Тави намного лучше для жизни человека, чем хирургические вмешательства. А также те рекомендации, guidelines э, использования ТАВИ, Америк, американские 
guidelines uh, recommend to Tavi. Также европейские рекомендуют Тави. Также в 2002 году была публикация Тави, новые рекомендации Тави. Что, 70, что люди с больше, чем 70 лет больше подлежены для... больше нуждаются в хирургическом вмешательстве, чем ТАВИ. Между 65 и 80 лет рекомендуется ТАВИ и, и хирургическое вмешательство вместе. Девайсы Тави. Девайсы Тави и... Эволюция в системах Тави. Венозные технологии Сапиен, Сапиен XT. За это время было видно, что другая венозная система Тави показывает Самые главные вопросы э, в венозной эвалюации от пациентов. Есть ли э, симптомы у пациентов? Пациент во время пациент может выбирать выбор пациента Тави или хирургические вмешательства. Кондиции для выбора Тави или хирургического вмешательства важны такие кондиции, как Выгоды пациента uh, именно в этом ТАВИ. Например, у женщин намного больше выгоды в, в хирургических вмешательствах. А также диабетики э, было доказано, что у них больше выгоды э, 
mortality is increased, but not mortality. Uh, the paradigm, paradigm of Tavi. Также это может э, меняться от вопросов, измены вопросов. Можно ли это делать или стоит ли нам это делать? Но мы должны спрашивать сами себе, как мы должны это сделать. До Тави, подготовка к Тави. В этой подготовке должны быть клинические работы, коронарные анализы и другие анализы, периферические артерии. И эти анализы тоже очень важны для планирования хирургического вмешательства. для улучшения результатов, результатов. Компьютерная томография в основном не до конца показывает размеры. Все это может также использоваться вместе для пациента, от пациента ситуации меняется. Компьютерная томография наши рекомендации также включают в себя все это Венозные и невенозные анализы. Шаги в процедуре, подготовка пациента, венозный и артериальный подход. Подготовка пациента, анестезия. Также это все может быть выбрано пациентом и врачом. Для того, чтобы начать процедуры, нам нужно минимум два входа венозного и артериального. с катетерами в артерии 5F или 6F. Также для ТАВИ процедур нам нужно вход для хирургического вмешательства. Также после всего этого мы можем начать аортический анджу. Представить и, и пройти клапан. Угол работы очень сильно зависит от
от идеального про представления угла клапана. Через этот клапан будет произведен вход в левый клапан, катетер. Если мы начнем баллон артичную валвопластырю, либо тави, либо баллон. Зависит от пациента. На всякий случай пациент должен быть готов к вмешательству баллоновой валвеопластрии. После этих шагов и всего и быть готовым к, к любым вмешательствам. Также арктический анализ. Мы должны найти локацию станжу. Баллон должен быть 3-5 секунд до дефлации. Рейви пини должен быть длиннее 15 секунд. Рядом работающая система должна быть э, резкая и быстрая. Это маленький пример того, как процедура должна проходить. В левой пенозе это баллон. Для... Okay, this is... Implantation on balloon. Имплантация тави в баллон. После позиционирования баллона и правильного сажения. Несмотря на все это, у Тави есть много осложнений, таких как инсульт, остановка сердца. Инсульт – это одна из самых больших осложнений во время Тави, которая происходит в, первом, в основном в первых часах операции. 
balon postulation, peripheric vascular disease, and aortic atheroma. General incidence is uh, between 2.7 to 5.7 percent and increase uh, one month mortality three or five fold. Subclinical cases are more common with MRI screening. But uh, this uh, problem can occur during uh, passage. Но все эти проблемы могут произойти во время пациента, во время во время операции и после нее. Это примеры для защиты. Остановка сердца это другая проблема. Может произойти в, во время операции. Это может произойти из-за анатомии пациента. Или не принимание импланта. Не подходящий – это другая проблема. Венозные или паравенозные. В основном происходит также просто, простатные заболевания. Это одна из причин. Одна из причин – это неправильная позиция, анатомические данные. Больше 75% улучшается за один год. Но это все относится к... Также мы видим паравольную... Доставка баллона которая является причиной еще одна причина Okay. Discharge. Uh, 
show us the prognosis difference between в этом рисунке мы видим Друг, другие осложнения – это васкулярные осложнения в ТАВИ. В сравнении с хирургическими э, осложнениями в ТАВИ 18%, 18 имеют васкулярные осложнения. Осложнения в Тауэр меньше, чем 4% это все результаты улучшенного опера... операционной техники. Корональная абстракция в основном, в основном происходит, от, зависит от нации. Осложнение. Высота в коронарной ости Деменция зависит от и в основном должна быть на 10 миллиметров. Еще одни важные детали. Корональные Но несмотря на последние клинические исследования, в основном одна третья уменьшилась риски. Структуральная капан, генерация структурального капана. Положительные истории Тави легче усвоить, лучше, усво... меньше проблем. Для будущего, будущее для Тави. Двухголовая ве... клапан, обсервационный показали, что за последний год нет никаких смертельных выходов. А также у молодого, молодого поколения Тави э, 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 
полностью Тави заменила хирургическое вмешательство у молодого населения. Смотря на все это, Тави э, с меньшими имеет лучшие выводы. Большое спасибо. Любые вопросы?